great to see so many faces here, but even more importantly than that, it's just absolutely humbling and impressive to be following these great speakers and the great ideas we've been hearing today. So really an honor to be here. Let me dive right in. So I work in computer graphics, as you can see in this depiction here. <laughs> so computer graphics has come a, a long way. We can render beautiful images for film. We can preserve artwork to the level where every chisel mark can be tracked, so that if you're all the way across the world, you can see what one of uh, the famous statues of Michelangelo looked like and study it in detail. And you can see buildings before they've even been built, so that you have an idea if you want to build it. What all of these images have in common is that they're frozen in time. And my interest is in getting these images to move, computing motion. Now, interest in depicting motion dates back centuries. Here's one of the earliest um, depictions of motion. It's uh, unrolled from a vase, and it has the little story of a goat that's jumping up to get a leaf. And this is from the third millennium BC. And that's basically my version of the history of computing motion. After that, we started using it for entertainment. Here's some scenes from uh, some early Walt Disney productions. And here's where we are today. We're able to tell stories that combine beautifully realistic motion and beautifully, uh, beautifully depicted imagery with storytelling. <laughs> Legend says this land was hauled from the ocean like a giant fish. And then it waited. In fact, these islands waited until every other country had been discovered before any human ever set foot here. Welcome to the youngest country on Earth. I really like this example because it shows images that could never have been created in real life and yet they convey a very real and tangible story about the youth of a continent, right? So I think that's really beautiful. So the work that me and my students are pursuing is with understanding very basic laws of motion and capturing those in computer algorithms. For example, we might look at the type of motion that a cylinder undergoes when it's crushed. If you step on a Coke can, you've seen these kinds of folds and wrinkles happen. And if we can understand these kinds of folds and wrinkles and how they form, we can put that to practice in various applications. For example, in the complex motion that you get in the swaying of a dress, wrinkling as a, as a, as a, as a lady walks down the catwalk. So we can use this in lots of different applications. And traditionally, we've thought of using it within the context of the film industry special effects, animation, and so forth. And I'd like to tell you about a few examples today in which technologies that we've developed with film and entertainment in mind have later transferred to other domains. And I think they have great promise of transferring into yet new applications in the future. So here's the simple example I'd like to talk to you about today. It's just the motion of a flexible strand of material. I don't think of this as being a particular scale. It might be very small, it might be very large, it might be just a Twizzler. But this material undergoes some interesting motions. It's bending, it's twisting, it's stretching, and you get some complex behavior out of that. When we first developed this, we were approached by Weta Digital, the makers of Avatar and uh, Lord of the Rings, and they said, we want to do hair for the movies. We want to make more realistic, subtle motion of fur and hair on characters. So we've been looking at how this technology can be used within those contexts. And we're still working with them on that. At the same time, we were also approached by Adobe. Adobe came to us and said, we're interested in building new paintbrushes for Photoshop and Illustrator. So we collaborated with them. And if you open up Photoshop today, or Illustrator, 
you can see this technology in practice. So today in Photoshop and Illustrator, you have paint brushes where each of the strands of the paintbrush is an actual physical bristle that's being computed on the fly. And you can change all of the properties, like the thickness and the stiffness of the brush, the length, and so forth. And you get different effects as you do this. So that was fun. And the question was, <laughs> The question was, how can these tools that we've been developing with an eye towards entertainment, towards consumer products, towards visual effects, be applied in other contexts? So this is some work that I didn't do with my students. This is work that was conducted at Berkeley and later at uh, UNC Chapel Hill, uh, where they took the strand technology that we developed and put it inside a medical application. You see, there's these new kinds of needles. They're called bevel-tipped steerable needles. And the thing about these needles is they have a beveled tip. And so when they're inserted into tissues, they start turning. And as they turn, because of the, of the, of the structure of the tip, they can be steered around. And so the way they're steered is by twisting this, the end that's outside of the body. And this is very useful because until now, if you've needed radiation treatment where little radioactive pellets are deposited, maybe inside the prostate, or if you needed a biopsy, people used to use straight needles. And with straight needles, you kind of had to eyeball it and hope for the best and <laughs> hope you don't hit any vital organs. Now, with the steerable needles, you can hope to go around these organs and get things right. Now, what's the, the challenge there? The challenge is there is that these things are really hard to steer because you're literally twisting in order to have the needle turn in different directions. So the idea is that if we can compute this motion, as shown here, then we can train surgeons with tools that are very hard to use otherwise. Or better yet, in the future, we can have robots that can follow different flight plans that are laid out by surgeons. So those robots need computer models of how this needle moves. Here's a different uh, direction. If you can, if, if you've ever uh, put honey on a scone, you've probably noticed that it kind of coils like a rope. So there's a kind of similarity between the motion of viscous fluids and the motion of elastic strands. Actually, this is true in lots of materials that are viscous. Here's some lava that's folding, so it again behaves like this elastic material. So it turns out that using the same technology that we developed for simulating hair and simulating paintbrushes, we can also compute the motion of these flexible strands. And that's interesting for a variety of applications. For example, one third of all the textile produced in the world is non-woven textile. So we all know about woven textile. That's the stuff where you have threads going in two directions and you weave it. But there's this other kind of textile that when you zoom in, it looks like a big jumble of spaghetti. And the way that textile is produced is by putting a molten polymer inside a drum. And the drum is spinning very rapidly. And there are little holes in the drum. And through those holes, the polymer just squirts out in these little strands. And then as it cools down, it clumps up, it hits other polymers, and it forms this kind of web. And in fact, that's what we find in baby diapers, in surgical masks, in high-throughput carpets, one-third of worldwide textile production. So it's important to understand the manufacturing of these kinds of um, uh, strand formations. So for that, there have been physicists that have been conducting controlled experiments. Here's one fascinating experiment. These, this is from the University of Toronto, in which honey is dropped onto a moving belt. And the nozzle is not moving. The only thing that's being controlled is the speed of the belt. And here's our simulation of this phenomenon. And as the belt moves quickly, you just get a nice straight line of honey. But as the belt slows down, you start to get this kind of meandering pattern. And as the belt slows down again, you get a phase transition into this other pattern a kind of a figure eight pattern. And as the belt slows down again, you get yet another pattern, which is going to be a coiling pattern. 
there's a little chaotic regime in between. So in fact, the physicists who worked on this called it a viscous sewing machine because it could make all these beautiful sewing machine patterns. And here's a comparison between the kind of results obtained in experiments and the kind of results produced by essentially the same code that we've been using in Hollywood. So that's kind of interesting. One of the most exciting applications, I think, for this, because remember, you're not moving the nozzle. You're holding it fixed, uh, is you can really quickly decorate cupcakes because <laughs> you just move the cupcakes right along. But my physicist friends tell me that this is important for other applications like stretchable electronics. So the idea is if you're designing stretchable electronics, you want the material to have some give. And when the material has some give, you don't want the cables to snap. So you have to have some way of depositing the cables such that they have a weave to them so that when you pull, they can stretch without snapping. Well, you could just try to lay out the weave very carefully. But if you understand these passive modes by which patterns can be formed, then you can figure out just the right speed at which to move the substrate as you deposit the cable so that you get a weaving pattern and not, for example, a figure eight pattern in which things are short circuited. So that leads to understanding. Actually, my collaborator at MIT, Pedro Rice, likes to point out that if you look for these patterns in physical phenomena, you can apply them over a huge range of scales. So on the right, he has a slide that shows the deposition of internet cables on the ocean floor. You have these giant ships, and as they move along, they drop a cable. And the cable falls extremely deeply into the ocean, and it's really hard to track what's going on there. You can send robots down sometimes, and other times even that's hard. And so the question is, how do you know how the cable is falling on the ocean floor? If it's falling in a straight line and the earth shifts later, then again it can shatter, it can, it can break. And if you go too slowly, you just get needlessly too many coils. So by developing a computer model of this phenomena, we can understand what's happening at that scale. At the other extreme, you have these tiny, tiny structures called carbon nanotubes. And they're used in microelectronics, and they're used in pharma, and they're used in all kinds of applications. And so again, you want to be able to deposit them and form certain patterns. So Pedro approaches this by building uh, contraptions, let's call them, in the lab. He builds actual experiments, and we approach this by using the same software that we've been using with Hollywood, but in this case, running it side by side with Pedro's experiments and comparing the two. And we've had a lot of really interesting discoveries uh, by doing that. One of the most recent ones is that the, uh, the, the way the cable is stored makes a huge difference. So we, we were trying to match up our experiments against Pedro's experimental results, and we couldn't get them to match up. And we said, well, we've looked at all the parameters, tried to match up the strength of the cable, the thickness of the cable, the force of gravity, and so forth, and nothing was matching up. And so in the end, we realized that the one thing the computer wasn't modeling was the fact that the cable had been stored in a spool. And all of the cables that Pedro had in the lab, of course, were stored on a spool. And why is that? Well, how else are you going to ship cables from one side of the world to the other? You have to store them somehow. So once we accounted for the way the cable was stored on the spool, we managed to get all the patterns that Pedro saw. And what this taught us was that the way the cable is stored on the spool is critical. So there was an example where simulation and experiments play hand in hand, and some things can only be done in simulation and not in experiments. So I want to wrap up with kind of where I think things are going. And the idea is that we're going to develop faster and faster simulation technologies as computers get faster and faster. And traditionally, whether it's a creative enterprise or whether it's a scientific or engineering enterprise, we have this kind of cycle of innovation where you have an idea, you conduct some experiment, and that experiment gives you some new insight. And from that, you develop a new idea, and so on and so forth. And of course, if you can replace the experiment by some predictive computation, then you may be able to get some faster innovation. But what if you could make the computation so fast that this loop completely blurs? There is no step-by-step -step process. You're repeatedly refining the idea 
while the computation is online. And that's the kind of technology we've been looking at recently. So here's a program that's just hot off the press in which a computer simulation is being used to show how a garment drapes on the body. But what's interesting is that the design of the garment is being edited on the left while the computer simulation is running. So there's no more of this trial and error of like make some pattern, construct it, put it on the person, or run a virtual try on, and then revise the pattern. Rather, that whole process disappears and goes into the background. I like to compare this to the intuition you get when tinkering with something. If you have one of those little metal toys that can be pulled apart if you do it in just the right way, and I give you two choices. One choice is put it on the table and stare at it and think really hard for as long as you want, and then pick it up and do something for five seconds, then put it down, and then repeat. Or the other choice is just meddle with it for a little bit. Well, meddling with it, tinkering with it, gives you a sense of intuition that you can't get in any other way. And I think as we start to have these kinds of interactive online simulations inside a design process, we can build that kind of intuition. So we're now transferring this kind of technology over to the scientific regime, where scientists like Pedro can have the computer simulation running side by side with the experiments and giving live feedback as the various parameters of the simulation are altered. So in summary, uh, I'm interested in computing motion. And this comes primarily from an, an interest in applications to film and entertainment. But as we've seen, some of the tools that we develop in this way have applications to engineering, to manufacturing, to medicine, and to consumer products that everybody is using. And of course, I'm not the one who's been doing this work. It's all of the fabulous graduate students at Columbia Engineering. And with that, I thank you very much for your time.